Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Amy Shapiro. I'm the Director of Programming and Engagement at the Anderson Collection. And before I start, I would just like to play Stanford's Land Acknowledgement. Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. So again, I'm Amy. Nice to see you all here tonight. Um, the Anderson Collection is so excited to have the artist Jean Shin here tonight as our guest. Jean was born in Seoul, South Korea, and raised in the US. She works in Brooklyn and the Hudson Valley in New York. She's also a tenured adjunct professor at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Her work has been widely exhibited and collected in over 150 major museums and cultural institutions, including at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, where in 2020, she was the first Korean American artist featured in a solo exhibition. Jean's work is on view in the current exhibition at the Anderson Collection, Convergence Zone. Her sculpture, her sculpture entitled Invasives is a first for the museum. Not only is it the first piece displayed on our building, but it is also surprisingly our first time hanging soda bottles from the front of the museum. Invasives is hard to miss. It is both beautiful and scary, illustrating that plastic waste is rapidly taking over our collective landscape, in this case, even the museum, and actively destroying habitats. Convergence Zone is an exhibition that explores humankind's relationship to the environment. This exhibition was curated by Jean McDougall, the Anderson Connect Collection Senior Registrar. She took inspiration from the opening of the Stanford Door School of Sustainability in 2022, and thinking about the ways contemporary art can be an access point to contemplate and understand the climate crisis. Jean Shin is committed to illustrating these challenges in her work, not just in the physicality of her installations, but also in the community that she builds to create them. She's just returned from Kenya, building a site-specific installation in collaboration with Desiree LeBeau, a pediatric infectious disease expert here at Stanford. They work with community members in Kenya who built and installed the work, of which you'll hear more about later in this evening's presentation. And here at Stanford, the LeBeau Lab has been working with students, staff, and faculty across campus to build pieces that will become a large art installation in the Biomedical Innovations Building to be unveiled next week. We are also so lucky to have Marcy Kwan here tonight in conversation with Jean. Marcy is an esteemed faculty member in the Department of Art and Art History and the co-director of the Cantor Art Center Asian American Art Initiative. Marcy is beloved among students. I've heard many speak about how inspired they are by her teaching, specifically in the class Art and Power. Marcy is a powerhouse of knowledge, challenging the traditional narratives of art history through her teaching, writing, and activism. Before I welcome Jean Shin and Marcy Kwan, I'd like to offer my thanks. I have a bit of a list, so please bear with me. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the McMurtry family. The Burton D.D. McMurtry Lecture was established upon the opening of the museum in 2014 and has really allowed us to bring established artists, thinkers, and performers to the museum and to the community here at Stanford and beyond. Thank you to Deborah Cullinan, Stanford's Vice President for the Arts, and Ellen O, Director of Interdisciplinary Arts Programs, for bringing Jean to campus through the Denning Visiting Artist Program and being an advocate and strong partner in this and everything we collaborate on. Thank you, Desiree LeBeau, for your important role, not just here, but in the world, and for bringing science and art together at Stanford, showing us how clear and crucial the connections between the two are. Thank you to Dave Lennox, the university architect, who is instrumental in encouraging connections between art, the architecture of our building, and the landscape surrounding it, including invasives. Thank you to Jean McDougall for curating a beautiful and important exhibition, and Mark Shunny, exhibition designer and museum preparator for his expertise in making the show become a reality. We so appreciate our, our partners, the hardworking staff here at Stanford Live. 
This event is truly an all hands on deck program for the small but mighty Anderson Collection team. Special shout out to Betty Noguchi, who always makes everything happen and happen well. Thank you to museum members and to all of you for coming tonight and for your ongoing support of the Anderson Collection. One last thing is many of you may have picked up cards and pencils, and um, at a certain point in the presentation, Marcy will give you a little hint that you can write your, your question down and pass it on to the aisles, and then she will read them as part of her conversation with Jean. So um, enough thanks and instructions. I'd like to introduce Marcy Kwan and Jean Shin. Thank you so much uh, for that generous introduction and for um, having us here today, and, and especially for inviting me to be in dialogue with Jean Shin, um, who's an artist who I very much admire. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Um, we have these uh, funny <laughs> uh, so, like headset mics, so it's, it's, uh, if I'm a little discombobulated, that's why. <laughs> um, but yeah, so to begin, Jean, um, I wanted to just ask you about uh, becoming an artist. You know, I have so many students who um, describe their own journeys and, you know, the kind of pressures that they face and, um, you know, the, the kind of desire to become an artist. Um, but I think it can be, you know, quite difficult for them to find a path. So I'm just, I'm just curious about your path. Um, well, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure being here and being in conversation with you, Marcy. Um, I'm going to say it was a challenging path because I have Korean parents mm -hmm. <laughs> who yeah. wanted me to be a doctor, surprisingly. And here, ironically, I'm at Stanford you know, working deeply in collaboration with a doctor. <laughs> They'll be so proud. <laughs> so um, I think that struggle of um, getting that validation that you're doing something worthwhile and contributing. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, um, I think I thought in terms of uh, how do I commit to doing this thing that I've done since mm -hmm. I was a child and I've always mm -hmm. wanted to be an artist. Um, and uh, thankfully I had a lot of early recognition. So there was a lot of support through Young Arts, Scholastics, all these amazing young teachers mm -hmm. um, who taught me and modeled that for me. Um, but once I entered the art world like this, it felt like there was a standard Mm -hmm. and that I didn't fit the standard. So it was the customization, the feeling like, oh, like there's all this art happening and yet I don't feel like I'm in dialogue with it. It doesn't fit me. Um, and so finding my own path, I started as a painter and having studied the history of art, I felt like I couldn't be in dialogue mm -hmm. because it was a Western history that was taught. Mm -hmm. And it was that um, I was constantly being othered Mm. And so if you can't be in a dialogue with the history, then you can't make work with yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And in this piece, Alterations, feels like it speaks to that, like, um, you know, this idea of standards. Um, can you, and it also speaks to kind of really, um, like, early interest, an early interest you have in kind of fashion and the body. And so I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about the piece in relation to some of those questions. Yeah, it was literally um, going away from painting as a structure, but understanding that I could actually have color and form mm. outside the canvas um, in an everyday scrap. So these are all the alteration hems that one would adjust to fit fashion. Mm. Um, and so I love that these um, pieces of fabric weren't needed or wanted, and there was an exactitude between the wearer and this customization. And I just like, isn't that perfect? We all need to find our path and things don't fit. And so making these installations out of the scraps also led me as a painter to go outside my studio mm -hmm. and to collaborate. And then of course there's the local um, alteration shops that were often Korean owned. Mm -hmm. So the Ajumanis were there welcoming me and saying, what are you making? <laughs> so it did make sense that suddenly I fell outside the art kind of making of history and professors in art school and really in my own community who mm. were my first collaborators in making these installations. That's amazing. I actually, I didn't know that about uh, the alteration shops specifically. Um, you know, another, we can uh, 
go back as well. But another piece I wanted to talk about was this one. You know, this is a piece that the you know I'm also Korean American. <laughs> uh, my um, my mom actually went to Los Altos High School, <laughs> uh, and you know it's like thinking about like kind of Celadon and this kind of familiar um, uh, texture and color um, and and kind of touch uh, that you know was kind of in my, like a part of my daily life, I guess. You know, at least we had a couple of Celadon bowls, although probably not real ones, imitation. Um, but when I saw this work, I was, I was so struck by um, uh, the fragmentation of them and the willingness to kind of, um, yeah, like, like script them in a way or, or you know, like, like topple them. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about this in relation to some of those questions. Yeah, I think that relationship to history is so interesting and in how as a Korean American, it's like the thing that one celebrates and everyone's got a mini vase as if it's this, <laughs> like the signature to mm -hmm. high art and that you could have any version of it. Um, but the true, uh, it's a classic, you know, mm -hmm. so it means that the tradition of the Celadon is really male dominated mm -hmm. and they want perfection and anything short of perfection means that they destroy the production. Mm -hmm. And I was so interested in perfection. So when I encountered that they're literally uh, crashing these um, parts of their art uh, practice because it's mm -hmm. not exactly perfect, I found that as a, as a cultural flaw, that as Koreans we always want something that is too perfect and unattainable. Um, and I really felt like, huh, when we celebrate the diaspora, you know, it's no longer original, it's no longer whole, but in fact, it is the fragmented uh, culture that lives and continues to evolve and change. And maybe not, quote, original or perfect, but mm -hmm. we, in our DNA, it's still that we're Korean, mm -hmm. you know? And so whether my Korean is perfect or not, it really doesn't matter because I know who I am, I know my deep connected roots. Yeah. And I felt like seeing the Celadon shards broken, broken by their makers, helped me to understand like, oh, I want to rescue them. Because for mm. me, every part of that shard is perfect. Mm. That's, you know? I mean, I'm actually also very interested in perfection and its uh, relationship to shame. Um, but um, yeah, like in terms of, you know, the shard and, and pieces, you know, I think about, um, like like a severing in my life has to do with, with language, you know? Um, and so do you, do you speak Korean? I do, yeah. I do, and speak it with my parents. Mm -hmm. But um, since the language is also the, the driving mm -hmm. force of learning, um, it's also a way to get stuck, mm -hmm. you know, because certain things can't, don't translate. Yeah, you know? tell me more about that. <laughs> well, I think that there's a disconnect between um, the things that you learn as an adult, you know, and so, Korean being my first language and a, and a child's language, you know. So the, there's familiarity, but they can't speak about it in art terms, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's something that I was taught later in um, art school and later in my professional life, you mm -hmm. know. So, so there's kind of a, the nostalgia of when I speak Korean, I feel young. Oh, that's really, that's really you interesting. Know? And I feel like a child, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and I, for my relationship with the Korean culture in Korea is that it's a fast moving, so much about a, a futurism mm -hmm. than it is about nostalgia. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's like, like I also feel young, but I feel childish because it's like, like I, I can't form the language. Um, and I, I think that that's maybe why these pieces spoke to me, you know, mm -hmm. because it is about like kind of, as you say, like kind of fragmentation as, mm -hmm. as constitutive. Um, yeah, and, and I think this question of memory is just so important in, in your work. I mean, there's, um, oh my gosh, can you, can you talk about this picture? I put my grandmother in here because you were talking about how to become an yeah. artist. And I think um, when I was in college, uh, my grandmother passed away. Mm. And it really struck a chord with me of like, what am I doing in art school? What am I learning? And I actually really pivoted to saying, like, I kind of want to unlearn everything here. Mm -hmm. And going back to these roots where wanting to um, kind of live in her legacy, um, mm -hmm. kind of understanding that she was a mother of, you know, six children that went from a war con country to 
traveling through China and coming back, mm -hmm. and then my uncle who immigrated to this country. I felt like these were things that I was mourning, but didn't know how to do it as an artist. And so sort of trying to find my own path that was closer mm -hmm. to um, the histories and legacies that they taught me about survival and about resistance, about it doesn't matter if things aren't meant to be the way it was. Um, so if art school wasn't working out the way it was or the art world wasn't treating me the way it should, that's okay, you're gonna figure this out. And I think learning really from their histories allowed me to kind of center myself mm -hmm. and uh, be quite determined to make art. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, like I'm just, yeah, I can't stop looking at her. I, I didn't, I, I didn't see the entire PowerPoint before, um, and I was like searching for a work on your website called Grandmother, and I was like, <laughs> what, what work is going to be <laughs> in, in the slide for this? So I mean, it's it's really, um, it, it is, you know, quite shows like how formative, you know, um, these like ideas of, of loss and, and history um, and remembering art, your work. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm really, yeah, kind of thinking about like the questions of materials and memory. You know, one thing um, I admire so much about your practice is that they, it shows me how materials remember and in a very kind of different way. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about like your research process mm -hmm. um, and your and your working process, which is so rich and I think really draws out like this question of memory and materials. Thank you. And I, we're looking at this project called Host, um, and I'm thinking about just like uh, when someone invites someone to their home and the first gesture is like taking out the silverware or mm -hmm. placing a setting for your mm -hmm. guest and that generosity and that the ritual around home, right? But it's also myths and a myth making, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and, and a ceremony that one has to invest in. Mm -hmm. um, so using old things like silverware or flatware, you know, everything is handled. It's been handled many, many mm -hmm. times. I feel like it has a, uh, kind of an aura um, mm -hmm. that is undeniable. And so when you set a table, I do the same thing. I set my chopsticks and I, it has this kind of visual memory of what that means mm -hmm. and who you are setting it for. Um, so when I'm constructing all of this, I'm allowing others to handle those materials as well mm -hmm. and, and then to recontextualize it differently. So here I'm making a tree stump that is clearly uh, cut so there's a loss there, you know, so that those ritual making, those ideas of hosts isn't um, done in a proper way or can't, can't be continued because families get separated, yeah. you know, or the quote, perfect home is a masquerade of families that are divided. You know? Yeah, the I mean, there's just, wow, there's just like so much to say in that, and and with this work, which is, um, you know, um, one thing that just strikes me is just the way that. Um, you know, you talk about patina, but then reusing all of these, these this kind of silverware, using it uh, to construct the stump, it's like, it's not like you can ever go back to that memory, or mm -hmm. it doesn't like, like it's it's gone, mm -hmm. but it's still there, right? Um, and so that, that kind of form of cutting is really, is really important and interesting to me. But it's also, you know, um, like this relationship between uh, supposedly inorganic and organic materials. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering about like that kind of juxtaposition mm -hmm. in your practice. Well, I think nature is inscribed in everything. Like this rug has mm -hmm. this ornateness, yeah. right? That all these natural, natural patterns are embedded in it. So the same thing with this, uh, this knife, you know, it has this it, insignia of a leaf, you know, and those are the heirlooms and different traditions, mm -hmm. right? So people will identify this knife and say, oh, well, that's the tradition of the rose, and the rose is this imagery. So I just love that it's embedded into the mm. work, um, you know, even though this may be, you know, cheap silverware, you know, made to look like something else, yeah. and it's not the real, um, you know, uh, heirloom. Um, but the transformation to me uh, is important, but I think it retains some of the hints to its former mm. life. Yeah, I really, I really love that. Oh, wow. Um, and more kind of silverware pieces. Um, I wanted to go to, uh, yeah, like if, I was wondering if you could talk about this work, which I found so kind of compelling and 
maybe a little like like distinctive from other works I'd seen. Yeah, everyday money, it's, it's figurative, which I don't often mm -hmm. work in that mode, but the trophies ha have this figure, and it's this three-inch figure, it's plastic. Uh, but we think of it as being this award, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and to me, it was a memorial, um, and just like the site of the National Monument, um, the potential of a site being both mm -hmm. empty and full, you know, mm -hmm. so again, that memory of like, it could be filled with protests, it could be filled with celebration, it could be filled with the militia, you know, mm -hmm. it really is open for any potential. And I thought the um, trophy was kind of like that, you know, you mm -hmm. have them ready made, and then you give that to a child, yeah. you know, for the potential to both show up and, and participate, <laughs> but also win something. There's an incredible optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's transforming all those trophy figures um, from sports to an everyday action mm -hmm. and really questioning um, what do we really reward people for, you know, and that, you know, once that optimism goes away and the reality of our life is that we work, you know, yeah. and we're often in uh, work that doesn't get um, accolades or isn't being seen as being uh, heroic, mm -hmm. you know. So if you go and see these larger installations, um, if you click on to the next images, you'll see that like the basketball player mm -hmm. um, is actually a mechanic or the karate master is a chef or mm -hmm. a cook. And I just love that these everyday heroes that we have now call them essential workers, you know? Uh, but mm -hmm. they're really our heroes. And mm -hmm. so this project really honors them yeah. and honors our history that this is kind of what we should be celebrating as a culture. Yeah, I mean, I think that these works for me are, are um, like, we're, we're really interesting in thinking about your practice because you're so good at pointing to the kind of every day and, and, and just kind of focusing our attention on it and, and pulling out the, the kind of stories or the significance of it. Like I, yeah, like it's, it's something I really, I really love about the practice is like the investment in the so-called ordinary. Mm -hmm. They're ordinary, but interestingly, all the parents held on to their mm -hmm. trophies mm -hmm. and their children have long yeah. passed, gone yeah. off, married, have children of their own. And yet in their attic are still these old trophies yeah. that they got in third grade. And I love that. And so if you look at the base of them, they still say third place. And, yeah. so, <laughs> and so I yeah. still think that notion yeah. of memory yeah. in this object, even though the child is, you know, six feet tall and have their own children, um, parents still can't let go mm -hmm. of this material. Then the material really isn't that important, mm -hmm. but it is significant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I'm going to click through like yes, seven please. images Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. you know as you can see uh jean's practice is so rich and i want to make sure we're kind of covering mm -hmm. um you know range oh that's so great um yeah and it's really incredible. this idea of putting it into the public space where others yeah. see each other mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. is really important yeah it's such a it's such a simple gesture but mm -hmm. it's one that um you're right, like you're like each of them is attached to a kind of moment in someone's life. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of imbues it with a sense of significance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like these works more about memory. Again, sorry, we have so many. Oh, this one I was really interested in as an art historian. <laughs> Uh, so the 35 millimeter mm. slide, I mean, it's a, sort of a generation, you know, mm -hmm. where all images, all family albums were captured in mm. this medium. Um, and then the notion that institutions like the Metropolitan Museum could translate their slide library into the digital. And I kept mm. imagining, what does the cloud look like? You mm. know, and are, are we trusting that, you know, that all of this material is gone yeah. and that it will live, quote, in the cloud? Yeah, so these were, these were slides that were obsolete, right? Yes. Yeah, from the mat. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I think that's a huge shift in our cultural mm -hmm. space to imagine even the Met can't hold on to their slides and think it's time to put them in the landfill. Yeah. And so this is my attempt to preserve that history and honor it because these are exhibitions as well that may not be digitally or be able to be searched. And I think mm -hmm. that's the kind of fear is that you can't stumble upon them. Yeah, I mean, this is how I learned art history. I was like right, I, I learned art history like right at that changeover from slides, from like actual physical slides to um, to digital slides. And it's like, uh, there was like something about encountering 
like the image as a ta as a small tactile like thing and that one um and then like the kind of spectacular quality of it being blown up in lecture mm -hmm. like you could only have that big image in lecture but every other moment you had to study it from the kind of small little um yeah image and so i think that this question of like obsolescence is really interesting to me and materials right it's like what is gained and what is lost seems mm -hmm. like it's such a it's such a central question to your practice. Yeah, and it's a double edged sword, yeah. you know, to to feel it, you mm -hmm. know, as we advance, how quickly we're advancing to that and not losing the things that were essential and only in that material. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's actually a, a, a question for me is like, how do you sit with I mean, maybe these works are an answer, but like how do you sit with that loss mm -hmm, or, mm -hmm. you know, like think about it as change? Well, if you uh, keep going, there's mm -hmm. some images that I have. These are art historical images. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, when you look upon that history, you see the gaps in the, mm -hmm. the, the way art history was presented. Yes. So even though there's <laughs> nostalgia for the, mm -hmm. you know, the slide carousel and that little image that's projected, we also know those projections were also mythic yes. and didn't allow enough inclusiveness for mm -hmm. all these other voices and art history in the making, right? So mm -hmm. the narrowness is also something I'm like, I'm happy to lose that. Yeah, yeah right? totally. <laughs> no, you're right. Like with, with change, you know, there's a, there's always, uh, there's always something lost, but also some, so losing something can be powerful mm -hmm. and important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then here's reflection, right? Looking at nature. So these are some of the art historical architecture spaces and, and things that happened during my visits. And then translated in the next work, um, which is called Pause and Huddled Mass um, mm -hmm. at the Asian Art yeah. Museum. Oh, come on. Yeah. Um, oh, this works amazing. Yeah. So this is a, a, my version of the scholar's rock mm -hmm. that we no longer really directly look at nature or mm -hmm. even nature in a Zen garden, but really think about the narcissism of looking at our phone mm -hmm. and that it's uh, completely mesmerizing because it sends us elsewhere as opposed to being present, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, I was telling Jean in the golf cart on the way over, <laughs> I was like, all of my nightmares have to do with my iPhone and it like malfunctioning, like, which is, I think, telling. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it's such a, it's such a striking image um, that also I think speaks to things like obsolescence and waste, which is something we'll get to. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, like, can you, can you tell me where these, where these phones came from? Well, we worked with a local recycler in the Bay Area okay. when we did this project, the Asian Art Museum, and um, it was really amazing to see how much old technology still yeah. exists. So it's it's a quick mapping of our 20 years, and we live from the first phone, the flip phone, to the mm -hmm. smartphone. Um, and our behaviors as well have changed. Our attention span has changed. Mm -hmm. Our ability to be focused has changed. And you said our biggest nightmares revolve yeah. around our phone. Mm -hmm. um, and then really talking about the waste stream that it causes, that e-waste mm -hmm. is an extractive process. And what happens you know, when you upgrade, the hardware has to go somewhere and it's really being shipped away yeah. and really polluting our um, land and polluting, you know, taking up a global footprint mm -hmm. in a major way, becoming our environment. Yeah, and I, um, we're definitely going to, like, continue on that thread, actually, when talking about your, your amazing project for Stanford, which we'll get to momentarily. Yeah. Um, but uh, most recent work, sorry, I want to, I just wanted to um, go to this work, though, to, um, you know, before we start talking about, like, the amazing Stanford project, um, just to ask you a bit about, you um, this really vexed, impossible, uh, mm. but also I think crucial maybe term um, of Asian American and what, you know, what that means to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a question that I, I probably change my mind on like every day. Yeah, um, it, is, it is vexing. Um, you know, I, I see it now as something one uh, sits in to, to feel part of a community. And that's how I redefine it for myself. Um, but a project like this allowed me to say, who is in my Asian yeah. American community? And how do we self-identify as that? Mm -hmm. And for me, it was the Asian part. Like, do I think of myself as Korean or do I think of myself more Asian? So mm -hmm. connecting to uh, other um, diasporas. And for others, it was like, am I American? People ask that, a long-standing um, 
communities who were been in Asia but not with, with citizenship. And so that was a fraught question to say, can I participate? I've been here for 10, 20 years, you know, and that that is a fraught citizenship is a whole nother camp. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, and I think it's also about culture. You know, so this notion of the inclusiveness, the minute you identify something, it means you framed it so that people are in it or out, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that can be both incredibly powerful as a, you know, community, as a network, mm -hmm. um, but also exclusionary. Yeah, yeah. Well, get, and, and how does that relate to this piece? Like, how did you make it? Oh, so the... I asked um, the three curators, and Suzette Men's here tonight, so she was one of the original um, curators yes. who I asked for a sweater. Yeah. And, and then... one of one of the preeminent, uh, like, thinkers who's really shaped my thinking on this idea of Asian American. So we'll yeah. ask her what yeah. it means. <laughs> Um, but really the, pointing the question, uh, she asked me, I pointed it back to the project and said, I'd love to know, and you know, do I do 80, age, like identity based work? And I said, do I, and can I in this mm -hmm. project? And said, how do I do that? How do we define our identity through this work? And so it was an unraveling project. So every person donated a sweater and then they would invite someone else that they thought of as part of the community. And then they gave a sweater and then we mapped our community. It was really, you know, they say seven degrees of separation, but I, for me, it was trying to understand seven degrees or one degree of closeness. Mm, you know, and we continue beautiful. to evolve in showing the work, unraveling it, remaking that community. And it's it, um, been added to every single time the show is shown, a local community gets connected. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. So when it traveled from New York through the country, every single city got to host the project. And hosting them, they had to identify other Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just show the work. You have to do the work to mm -hmm. know the community. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, that's quite striking. Um, and I think just really like, like the visualization of those threads and like actually being able to like touch them or, or feel like you can touch them is really, yeah. Well, this is also before there was the internet in right, full on right. Facebook, you know, right. this was even pre MySpace. So we actually didn't know who knew who. And now mm -hmm. we, this was only knowing people in a physical way through mm -hmm. friendships. Mm -hmm. um, so now if I did the project, everyone's like, oh, I know everyone. Right, and actually, right. you don't really know them. Yes, yeah. your face friends on <laughs> the social media, but I'm like, I don't know who you are. Yeah, you know? totally. So that's a, it was a very different time period in 2006 mm -hmm. when we did the project. Yeah, yeah and, and that's something else that really strikes me about your practice is just um, the way you conceptualize community and like think and, and really like kind of think about community in terms of both creating kind of site-specific sculptures, um, but also thinking about like the public. And so I'm just curious, to, if, I'm curious to hear you talk about community. Well, uh, in making the work. works like this, you make the community. Mm -hmm. And I think Suzette was the one who said, you make imagined communities actually possible. You know, and it's true, I didn't know this community, now I do, I live it, mm -hmm. and they're my close friends. But when it went out, it was through friends' invitation, like Ellen O's in this, project and I didn't know her until years, decades later, you know, Hyun Soo Min's been in this project until yeah. years later, and then I got to meet them. So it, it kind of is the project itself um, turns into my life, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that um, way. That's kind of like, amazing. I, I imagine it, yeah. I, I make the project do the work, and then I can live in that space. Yeah, I mean, Eleanor is the source of everything. Yay, Ellen. <laughs> Ellen. We, we love Ellen. Um, she is literally the connector. She literally, she literally is so special. She, her like, her media is people. Yeah, it's true. I've, I've, it's, and she is very skilled. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wanted to also, um, God, we, there's just so much of your work. Um, I'm sorry, but I wanted to talk about. Uh, um, Oh, this piece, which I love in terms of community. It just feels mm. like, I mean, the, the gesture of creating community and like an open table is just, um, yeah, just so eloquent. You know, I thought of community as like, then I can provide a space for community to show up at. Mm. Whereas others are about participation, about 
do asking the prompt and asking material exchange. And here I was like, oh, it's a community of trees. Mm. It was a whole LA, so the trees were planted to make one massive landscape, a pictorial landscape. And I thought, but they're a living community. They live together and mm. they're dying together. And this is around climate change and just unsustainable planting. Mm. And so in this long picnic table, it's like 50 feet that they are um, creating a space for people to gather, mm. to slow down, to be in space as opposed to rushing from one itinerary, see one art for a mm -hmm. second, take a picture and move on. It's mm -hmm. like here you are invited to just sit with, with someone else hopefully, or someone yeah. else joins you. And I kept thinking about how public art could be a space where it invites community to gather uh, mm -hmm. and be a community just by showing up. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. And I think you've really done an amazing job. I mean, look at all these pictures. I mean, we, we, we can maybe go back to this, but I, I just want to say, I think you've done an amazing job in terms of building community at Stanford in your kind of year long kind of den, uh, kind of position as the Dunning visiting artist. Um, and I, I wanted to, you know, before we, we go to a very exciting video, um, uh, you know, just have you talk a bit about your work at Stanford. Um, oh my God, there's, these are all amazing projects yeah. that we have to go so, back to. So this, is, <laughs> yeah. this is kind of about yeah. the plastic wave. So yeah. I think in some way um, our landscape has changed yeah. so much and so much of it is lost species mm -hmm. and loss of biodiversity and collaborating with scientists. And so all of this work was leading up to my invitation mm -hmm. by Ellen to meet Desiree and to have this Denning uh, mm -hmm. Fellowship here, where in residence, I'm really thinking about how do I engage this community about plastic waste, mm -hmm. which is the work that Desiree has been doing for decades and in her scientific, um, you know, kind of activism, but really thinking about infectious disease and how mm -hmm. plastic waste is the vessel in which they breed when water is, is held on it. So I've been thinking about water. I've been thinking about like how the safety and the quality of water for mussels to be bred and do the filtering. Yeah. And then suddenly there's this other cause where plastic yeah. is this kind of other um, incredibly toxic thing for our water. Yeah, I mean, fresh water, I mean, maybe you can explain um, a bit behind it, because when I when I saw this this piece, I was kind of blown away, and it is such an, like, a, such a, a clear kind of precedent, or there's such a clear link between the work you did at Stanford and, you know, kind of thinking about obsolescence in the 19th century and then now. So, so yeah, can you explain this? Yeah, so these right. vintage um, buttons, um, I happened to discover them for, mm -hmm. in a warehouse, and in the 18th century, um, we realized that they were so beautiful. And so, you know, they could make this pretty pearl button mm -hmm. and it was like a status symbol that you mm -hmm. can have in fashion. Um, obviously plastics came along and then there was no need, but we had already pretty much gone through all our rivers and oceans and destroyed our natural mm -hmm. habitat and our incredible mussels that, and, and other species that filter the water. Um, so when I discovered them, it was like these vintage things didn't even get used in the way a consumer would use them, didn't get to be seen. So I'm in, in essence returning them to the water, to the oceans, to the river. So this is on a pier. And I wanted them to be reckoning, you know, and looking at this genetically um, bred muscle that a scientist and an ecologist worked mm -hmm. so hard to make sure that the native species were there mm -hmm. and thriving um, and that we should appreciate their beauty in the living and not mm -hmm. in this dead form. Mm -hmm. So it is a form of loss, but also mm -hmm. reckoning of our past histories. Yeah, I mean, the last time uh, we spoke, when we had lunch the last time you were here, you were like, actually, I think all of my work is about mourning. And I think, I think like, this conversation is helping me see kind of threads of, of history and memory and, and remembering and mourning in, uh, in your practice. Yeah, I feel like we're all grieving in ways. Yeah. And um, whenever I pick up an object now, it feels like, oh, there's a history here. And there's a history that we're not um, first understanding, acknowledging, and even reckoning with. And so how do we move forward is like, how do we deal with that past? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, and a lot of it is mourning because we've done some horrible things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Both to our environment and to ourselves. And plastic is one mm -hmm. of those things that we continue to produce and it doesn't go away. And this is a beautiful installation at the Anderson, which apparently Jason told me in the morning, it just glows. Mm -hmm. And so it's called Mountain Dew. 
Um, <laughs> Wait, that's, so that's, that's, a, that's like, a selling point. It's like so good. <laughs> uh, but it's displaced all our mountains and our rivers mm -hmm. and waters, and uh, the bottle industry should be ashamed of themselves, but they have a great market campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so the, I see them as the ultimate invasives. They are everywhere. Um, and this leads us to the project in Stanford, which is looking at medical waste and how those, the scientific community and the labs, um, medical professions are, of course, trying to save us and help mm -hmm. us and our health. But in the process, they're not really doing a self-examination and being accountable to the plastic waste on the sake of it's, it's got to be sanitary, maybe you know, it's toxic, but most are not. And there's definitely ways in which uh, their practice could be improved mm -hmm. um, by not, by not um, investing in so much in single-use plastic. Mm. And so, um, yeah, just tell me, what was it like collaborating with a scientist? Well, <laughs> thankfully, I have a scientist who's incredibly bold <laughs> and incredibly, um, you know, self um puts herself out there first. Mm -hmm. And so she did the first uh, audit for her lab. And I feel like that was so telling, mm -hmm. you know, and that it makes everyone highly aware of how much plastic they're handling mm -hmm. and where it goes. And I think that's a really incredible, brave move and hope that everyone follows suit um, when you see the number and the amount of plastics. Mm -hmm. And we're just taking a, a fraction of that uh, for our installation. There is like, it would fill wow. this auditorium in a wow. day. Really? Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, and, and what was the kind of, I guess, uh, like interest in, in this idea of collaboration and specifically coming to Stanford? Um, I'd love that there's uh, research going on and, yeah. and you ch talked about my research process and mm -hmm. I've always struggled as an artist, you have to produce the final thing mm -hmm. and I'm not um, I'm really interested in the process and even more I'm interested in the research, mm -hmm. but I can never have the time. Mm -hmm. So a fellowship like this allows me the engagement to speak with people who are been doing this work a really mm -hmm. long time. And so I'm making the work with them, understanding mm -hmm. the issues from the ground up, you know, and then also hoping that after the installation, the work still goes on. Mm, right. Yeah. And that the art is just a catalyst for us to kind of mobilize these thoughts together and truly to have a thought partner in it um, and mm. to be transformed by the making of art, which I think is a very tactile and hands on. Mm. And when you move your body and you spend so much time with it, like mm. there's body memory. Yeah, too. Absolutely. And so I know a lot of people can't throw away a plastic bottle in my presence. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You can never do that in Desiree's presence. My God. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that, that we're, we're like monitors of your conscious, you know, because we have worked in this space. Um, but I hope that everyone keeps us, each other in check. Yeah. That's, it's really, um, it's just been amazing to see your impact like here and, and uh, like see your activeness, but also to see once again, like, you know, questions of, of um, you know, sustainability and waste um, and kind of, you know, how to, how to continue to think about these things into the future, but you're also at the same time building community. And so there, and you're building community around these questions, which I think is really, um, yeah, it, it's really just what needs to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's been wonderful to see like de departments of art go into a department of, of, of medicine, vice versa for the D school. So there's been so many different mm -hmm. arenas. This campus is huge, but people are huge. often in silos because yes. the distance is far. You know, yes. but with this project, they have been in each other's spaces and finally yeah. becoming incredibly familiar. Yeah. Uh, and I love that. That alone is is traversing um, paths that don't necessarily cross. Yeah, your medium is people too. <laughs> um, but uh, we're also very excited now to debut uh, a video, a brief video. It's only about seven minutes, but um, it's, uh, I mean, do you want to give a Brief yeah. Um, so we're going to watch uh, Sea Change, um, which is our project in um, Kenya. And this is really uh, a tribute to the Lobo Labs um, and her nonprofit in Kenya called Harry. Um, so you're going to see this journey we took, uh, beautifully captured by my artist friend, um, Moko Fukuyama. So we should just Great. play it and yeah. watch. I was told. Oh no, back. I think the okay. video should be embedded. There, there we go. Oh, yes, I did it. Huh. 
Nara wenye umbo la mawimbi ama wimbi la bahari uliojengwa kwa kutumia chupa za plastiki umezinduliwa mjini Diani katika kaunti ya Kwale. Munara huu umetundikwa katikati mwa muji wa Diani ili kutoa hamasa kwa wakazi na watalii wanaozuru eneo hili dhidi ya kutupa plastiki kiholela. Ukiwa na umbo la wimbi la bahari, munara huu unaashiria kuwa viumbe vya baharini huathirika pakubwa kutokana na plastiki zinazotupwa mijini na kuishia baharini. Jean Shen. I'm an artist from New York. We're here in Diani to celebrate the opening of my public sculpture called Sea Change. And here at Kenya, this beautiful coast, um, but the plastic waste that goes into the ocean is harming the environment, is harming the marine habitat, and ultimately harming the community as well. 450 years is the life of a plastic. So it will be here before us, after us, and we're using them as if it just lives in our environment but it will become the environment for sure. I create monumental site-specific installations using accumulations of everyday objects, usually sourcing consumer waste through community participation. My work invites the public to witness and confront social challenges and ecological harm. We're connected by water, and I wanted to make this big wave. It's like a tsunami wave ready to crash on us. And ultimately, if we don't solve the plastic pollution crisis, that sea, that wave, that ocean that will be crashing on us will be the plastic debris. And I wanted to make that problem visible. When I arrived, it was an African blessing, meaning it was pouring rain. Despite the obstacles of heavy rain and flooding, when I finally met the participants, they were so welcoming, embracing me with excitement, curiosity, and open arms. Asante, the team. Nice to meet you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, Hello. team. Mesha. Mesha. Would you mind seeing the rest? Yes, I want to see everything. Thank you so much. Uh, zip these tight yeah. as lock, yeah. a little bit tighter. Little that would be great. Yeah, yeah. It's a big way. <laughs> um, it's much bigger than I anticipated. Uh, so it's taking a little bit longer, you know. Of course, the rain doesn't help, but it's happening. So I'm just grateful. Well, I work often very site specifically. So I come to a site as a visitor and I have ambassadors who are my partners, collaborators. And then they, we talk about what are the issues that concern us? What are the issues that we want to do better? And so art is one of those tools to change the world, right? To be a catalyst. So the thing is, how do we come together to create an amazing, like large scale public work? But that's not the end result. It's the process, it's the friendship. Like me. It's meeting you all, right? That is really the, the, the driving force of the work. The next day, when the sun came out, we took inventory of how much plastics were prepared and ready for the installation that week. This collection of waste was overwhelming. So powerful and yet so beautiful to see it brought us together. Well, the project um, is in partnership with Harry Kenya, and we've been here working and planning for so long, years with my collaborator and partner, Desiree Lebeau, a professor from Stanford University. For a long time in my lab, I always dreamed of somehow pairing science and art. I just think that the two are beautiful complements to one another. Jean told me she was really into labor-intensive art. <laughs> now I know what that means. <laughs> it has been a great um, experience. As you can see, we've been able to bring on board so many community representatives, community groups that we've partnered with um, to create, uh, to collect the plastics first, to clean them, to cut them and uh, zip them together to prepare the sheets for the um, sea change uh, sculpture. Again, I'm a physician and so I care very much about the link between health of the environment and health of the people. 
Um, we know that plastic waste is the number one area where disease-causing mosquitoes breed. We're bringing awareness here, but what we're actually doing is convening a lot of key stakeholders. The national government, county government, the municipality, the local businesses, the community members, other NGOs to come together, create and co-create innovative solutions to tackle all of the environmental health challenges that are here in Diani, Kenya. And we're coming up with a plan as we're in the sweltering heat here. Melting. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. <laughs> it's true that if we want to save the planet, it's the industries, the large petroleum-based extractive industries and policymakers that need to make this change. But also, change happens through hands-on experience. If we can mobilize to create this monumental sculpture together in such a short time, we can come together with communities to do other things with a shared goal. As a resident and as a son of this uh, town, um, I'm glad to see that action is being taken. You know, they say better late uh, than never, but never late is better. But uh, we are doing it now and that is that uh, what actually matters the most. Money that will go into it is not for the material, it's for the labor, it's for the care. Right? And that is the connection that we want to have as opposed to thinking about art as a pretty picture. You know, I make things that are often invisible, very, very visible. So the plastic problem here is everywhere, but you see it together in a sculpture. You see it together as a wave, and then it has that impact. This sculpture is going to sit there and be a reminder to all of us about our individual actions and the fact that we should stop using single-use plastics at all means. This kind of work is very intentional and takes patience. It's not all or nothing, winner takes all mentality, seeking quick and easy solutions. It's investing in people, intergenerational change, integrating small changes toward long-term solutions that can navigate our complex lives, including our dependency on plastics and eliminating plastic pollution now. Wow. Well, you can see I could never describe yeah. <laughs> what that was like. Um, I'm so touched and really incredibly moved by that experience. It really has been an epic journey. It's, it's incredible. Um, so, you know, uh, in a couple minutes, we are gonna take a Q and A. Um, and so I just invite anyone who uh, wants to ask a question to write it on your card um, and pass it to the ushers and we'll, we'll kind of go to Q and A in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, in, in the meantime, I just, you know, as you said, I'm sure, like not even a video could capture the experience, but, um, but yeah, what was it like? And what was so, what was kind of the most surprising thing to you? Um, the curiosity, mm. you know, people um, haven't made art uh, before mm. and mostly I was working with scientists, um, mm. again, researchers and people in the Harry community. Um, so their commitment um, was vast. And I was also uh, shocked, but also incredibly welcomed by mm. all the other environmentalists who were also doing similar work mm. in this very small town. Oh, really? There, yeah. were, there were others? So, who, yeah, what was... There was, a, a, like, saving the turtles. Oh, wow. They were, you know, so was, there was so much interface between different scientific research, mm -hmm. different, you know, I felt like interspecies, including mm -hmm. the water as an entity for us to look at, you know. Um, but for me, it was also thinking about community. Mm -hmm. You know, um, saving the turtles is amazing, um, but I also feel like we need to have water for people mm -hmm. and, and reason for people to exist in that. Um, and so being an outsider and being embraced um, in short time mm -hmm. through the ambassadorship of Harry and really getting to be able to meet community, um, dealing on the front of the crisis, you mm -hmm. know, um, that was incredibly meaningful and impactful for me. Um, also making art in a different capacity, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of slow and then so quickly being able to mobilize and get things done, you know? Yeah, and it I was think... big. I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, um, like, I finally got a sense of the scale after seeing the video. It's immense, immense. Yeah. And I think it really addressed how immense the problem is. 
mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think in uh, the kind of practice I have here in America, you know, especially with public art, it's like so much planning, so much planning, and so much planning, mm -hmm. you know? And there it's like mobilization, you know, mm -hmm. let's get it done. Um, and I love that spirit. I felt like actually very Korean. <laughs> like to last yeah, I mean, totally, get it done. totally. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the other thing that struck me in the video is just hearing you say, um, which I think is has been flowing through this conversation and all of your work, um, but that you make the invisible visible, and I'm just wondering if you could if you could reflect a little on that. Um, well, it's interesting. It's my experience, right? Mm -hmm. I can be anywhere and. Um, and not be seen. Mm. And I definitely feel like mm -hmm. I come from like that personal experience. Like I'm there, but no one might even notice me. Mm -hmm. um, and then sometimes when people do notice mm -hmm. me, it can actually be uh, for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. right? And as we have found out, it could be lead to violence as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do find visibility as a quandary. Yeah, um, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm hoping to do is kind of collect all those feelings, mm. you know, um, and in those objects, you know, we take things for granted all the time. We devalue things um, when they're just, th they're already there, mm. you know. So I just love to elevate and highlight uh, the things that have always been there mm. and ha have always done the work. Mm. Uh, um, and that says a lot about who we are. Right? Yeah, I mean, it reminds me, um, yeah, it's just, you know, I think that it, it flows again into like, like for me, like a, another word that comes up is attention, right? You're directing our attention to certain things, to a present moment or to like a crisis or to each other. And, you know, your art in some ways kind of orchestrates our attention away from, you know, the things that, um, you know, we're told <laughs> that are important um, and, and focuses on, on, everything that's been overlooked mm -hmm. um, and how powerful all those things are when they come together. Yeah. I mean, you can see it in, in like just that immense wave, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is so beautiful, but also so horrifying. So horrifying. Yeah. And I think also the, the tension is that we're always thinking about something else out there in the future, but actually if you just look around and stay mm -hmm. still, that everything that you have is right there. Yes. It's just about caring for it. Mm. It's about paying attention. Um, are and attention and care the same thing? Mm. I'm, I'm, yeah, mm. it's a genuine question. I, it's something I, 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 I've often wondered. Yeah, it's not the, the things, it's really how you think of them, right? Mm. And then how you take care of it, right? Mm. And bring, bringing your own attention to valuing it. And it mm. can be a scrap, it can be trash, it can be something no one else wanted. Yeah. And I think that could be people, the environment, you mm -hmm. could just substitute that thing with anything. Mm -hmm. It could be yourself, even yeah. your self-worth. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what I appreciate um, also about what you're describing is the way that you are really, um, you know, you're talking about your experience, uh, but it's not like, there's not like a one-to-one, -one, you know, like, like mm -hmm. illustration relationship, but, you know, an experience informs the way you look at something. Of course, our positionality always does that. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's, it's also attuning you to things that other people might not see, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's really powerful. Yeah. It's the full experience. It's not one mm -hmm. trauma or one mm -hmm. discrimination or one yeah. event in my life. Yes. Um, but it's, my upbringing, it's my histories, mm -hmm. you know, it's an embodied, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I look and interact with the world, it, I see these relationships um, and it becomes really powerful to say, oh, and how would I empathize with that? Mm -hmm. You know, when I feel like I, I have those histories that allow me to empathize in ways that allow me to see people mm -hmm. uh, and not just see the situation. Yeah, yeah. Are we, we have questions or great, thanks. Thank you very much. Ooh, got a few. Um, so the first one is, does narrowing our individual views into personal digital silos take away from our collective sharing of art history? Marcy, you got to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's, 
like like everything, it's like it, it does both. You know, <laughs> um, you know. I think I think this question is is like, are you you know the digital is promising this like huge expansiveness where you get like everything right, like you get all of the diversity, but in fact like you know it's it's actually quite personalized, and so like wh what's the tension between that? Um, and and yeah, I, I would just say it's like it's just all about how you use it. You know, um, uh, so another question, second question is, uh, uh, Christo and Jean-Claude uh, dissemble their site-specific installations and sell portions to collectors. As your works decay, might you sell, say, bottles from Sea Change to collectors? It's an interesting question. <laughs> I mean, actually, it is a good question. Is is does your do, like do you sell your work? My collectors <laughs> buy sea change uh, <laughs> debris, <laughs> the debris of yeah. our debris. Um, it's all speculative, you mm. know. Um, for me, the value has already been done, right? Mm. Um, how can it be preserved? How can the stories and legacies mm. continue? Yeah, that would require extra funding. And if that <laughs> yeah. means through collector base, great. Mm. If it's through other means, science, great, you yeah. know? Um, it's always and, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I don't rule it out, but I don't also um, bet on it, right? Mm. So I think there, that's just one option. Uh, okay. And they're a great model. Great. I mean, that's it's a good question. In <laughs> uh, thinking about waste, pollution, uh, uh, reuse, how does it feel to, quote, dispose of the art you've done when an installation is complete? It's interesting. Yeah, I have a hard time letting go. Yeah. <laughs> so thankfully, I've thought of my projects as giving it second life, but mm. then I have recently then thought, after my projects, can I give it a third life? Can it mm. also reconstitute into other works? So I just recently did that at the Thomas Cole Museum. Oh, yeah. So I reused the art crates and filled my uh, studio debris and project remnants into it. So I've created like another version. So mm. this just gives me license to hold on to everything, <laughs> um, including when eventually the invasive starts degrading like, you know, I'm going to have a plan for that. And when the museum conservator said, you can't show this anymore, I'm like, oh, just you wait. Uh, <laughs> we can't show it exposed this way. Have fun. But, <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I, I, I want to challenge those notions for mm. sure, um, that they don't have to be disposed. Why should I dispose of it? It mm. just degraded into a different materiality, yeah. and it's transformed by the elements. It's had life. Yeah, um, you're, yeah, absolutely. And, and this uh, notion of museums having to hold on to something like forever, yeah. a certain state, was like, that's almost impossible. Yeah, I mean, you it's know? something I, I talk about with my students. We're actually teaching, I'm teaching a class um, this quarter with Hideo Mabuki, who's um, in applied physics. So I'm also doing my own um, uh, science art collaboration, which has been like mind bending and amazing. Yes. Um, but you know, like we, we hold sections of the canter and one of the big questions is like, everyone's like, you know, we're talking about the objects, but it like, like what are, you know, there's so much there to freeze them in place. Um, but I, but I also think kind of the other thing you're saying is you're kind of redirecting our, our attention or helping us rethink what disposability actually is. And also yeah. what permanence is, yeah. you know, so museums always think Absolutely. about the permanent collection. And mm -hmm. yet, do these objects, and who belongs to them, mm -hmm. you know, um, and who, who gets the right, mm -hmm. who gets the right to preserve them or mm -hmm. live with them? Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes living with them is to activate them mm -hmm. and activate them cult culturally. And, not, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it does mean degrading. Use means degrading. But mm -hmm. by using them, again, you, you're mm -hmm. um, interacting with something that's incredibly powerful and sacred. Yeah. yeah so maybe that is also a form of life. Um, so when uh, uh, something across disciplines, probably collaborating, uh, how do you negotiate uh, the aestheticization of science by artists and the romanticization of art by the scientific community? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> uh, what steps do you take in, in co-creation of ideas to ensure collaboration? Wow, these are, these are great questions. I'm, I'm very impressed. 
What? Yeah. You can't assure anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what I do think it's about leaning into those questions. And, you know, again, if, if you need to push back or to inform, great. Mm -hmm. But also you choose your collaborations wisely, mm -hmm. right? If you're misunderstood, how do you get to a place of understanding, at least to the point to move forward? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that if we start with those sides, we'll stay there. Mm -hmm. But again, just the openness of saying, mm -hmm. you don't know what we're going to do. And I don't, you know, so, yeah. so not making those assumptions. Right, so that already is setting up a polarity. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of artists are incredibly interested in science, you know, and, and we're more interested in the science than we are in the aesthetics, you know. <laughs> and then oftentimes when sci scientists work, they're interested in, in art, mm -hmm. really genuinely interested in art, you know. So, so our natural instincts is like, oh, I can get the aesthetics right. It doesn't really mm. have to pitch to something mm -hmm. in the same way as the science, like they know the science, mm -hmm. you know. And so I love that we're leaning toward our passions, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we meet as opposed to leaning toward our um, limitations, mm -hmm. right, and having that be the driving miss. Uh, connection. Right? Mm. Um, what like tips would you give practical tips for people who, for artists and scientists who are collaborating? I, I think that um, this is something that's so important to think about at this university right now. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, it doesn't have to be scientists or artists. It could just mm -hmm. be every collaboration has to be built on trust. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have it, you shouldn't be collaborating. Mm -hmm. Right. So how do you build trust? Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it takes time. Mm -hmm. You have to invest yes. in that. It takes time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you have to tend it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I believe that's the last question. And I think it's a really, it's a really beautiful note to end on um, trust. So um, with that, uh, please join me in thanking Jean for being in conversation with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also um, want to invite you all, of course, to see the project that we're doing and the BMI building. It opens on the 16th, but between now and the 16th, we have workshops there almost every day from nine to six. So as mm. I say, it's a hands-on experience. It's labor intensive. Yeah. You learn by just showing up and doing it with us. Amazing. And also so go come. to the Anderson Collection and, and, and check out, out that this. installation. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you all so much for being with us today uh, during playoff basketball. <laughs> <laughs>